This call is now being recorded. Hello everyone and welcome you to the international webinar on innovations and applications in material chemistry. It is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for the post-lunch session of the webinar, Professor Paul Milner. Professor Paul Milner is the Emeritus Professor of Bio-Nanotechnology, University of Leeds, UK. Professor Paul Milner holds PhD in Plant Sciences from Department of Plant Sciences, University of Leeds, UK. And he holds BSc in Biochemistry from the Department of Biochemistry, University of Leeds, UK. He has done his postdoctoral work at Purdue University, Indiana, USA, and Imperial College, London. His research interest is focused on nanoscale engineering of surfaces for biosensor application, targeted nanoparticles for imaging and drug delivery, lanthanide nanocomposites, photosensorizer loaded nanofibers for bioremediation and bioaffinity systems. Professor Paul Milner is a recipient of several fellowships and awards such as European Molecular Biology Organization Short-Term Fellowship for the work at Lund University. He also received British Council Awards and he also got the fellowship to visit Max Planck Institute and also to visit to University of Tor Vergata. Professor Paul Milner has guided 40 doctoral students and he has published more than 130 peer-reviewed publications and authored two books and has written 24 book chapters and has two patents for his credit. Uh, he has completed 40 sponsored research projects. And this topic for of presentation of the webinar is nanoparticle for targeted delivery of anti-cancer drug. I welcome Professor Paul Milner for the webinar and request you to start your presentation. Thank you, sir. You can start your presentation. OK, um, I'm Professor Paul Milner. Um, I'm from the University of Leeds, which is one of the older universities in the UK, um, after Oxford, Cambridge, Durham. There's a lot of big civic universities in the main UK cities were created slightly over 100 years ago. So Leeds in the UK is often described as the north of England, and that's accurate, but remember on top of England sits Scotland, and um, Leeds is more or less the exact centre of the UK of the UK main island. I don't, I'm not including Northern Ireland, which is part of the island of Ireland. So I did my degree and PhD there, went to America and then back to Imperial College London and then accidentally became an academic uh, at Leeds, where in the department that trained me. Um, since then, I've had two half careers really i started as a plant scientist and for about 40 percent of my career then got interested in working in biomedical sciences and the emerging field of nanotechnology and i'm going to tell you today about delivering anti-cancer drugs via targeted nanoparticles actually the core interest which was exactly the same when I was a plant scientist as while I've been a uh, biomedical scientist, is molecules recognizing other molecules in plants. It was at plant cell surfaces, but since I became a biomedical scientist, it's uh, particles that attach to artificial surfaces for all sorts of different purposes. And the main things I've worked on are biosensors, which I'm not going to tell you about, but I'm going to tell you about delivery of anti-cancer drugs via targeted nanoparticles. I'm very familiar with your part of the world. I've been to Panjim probably three or four times, but I have good friends, and I say they're friends, they're not just collaborators and colleagues, good friends at Bits Pilani Goa, which is not so far down the road from you in Vasco, of course. Okay. So you see at the bottom, all the sorts of people I had funding from, it's important to acknowledge them, and particularly the EU when the Britain, before Britain exited the EU. Now, targeted nanoparticles, we can use them for various things, but simplifying the story, you can use nanoparticles for imaging, 
and they had, do have advantages. Um, rather than just a generic fluorescent or colored tag, which is rather diffuse, if you label a nanoparticle, you've got a point of light or color, which is easy to see. We can use nanoparticles for drug delivery. Uh, and I'll tell you about the advantage of those. And you can use nanoparticles for both. Increasingly, there's a field called theranostics where they will image a pathology, not always cancer, but cancer is the predominant pathology. And then you can do something like change the temperature or the pH or put some light on the particles and deliver the drug. And of course, that's that therapy. So thera theranostics, therapy, diagnostics, fused, if you think. So I'm going to start by talking about how we target the nanoparticles. And then I'll talk about the different particles we use to drug packaging with some actual examples. So I'd like to start by thinking about the size of things. And I could have a whole hierarchy of things with this. But an antibody, an IgG, most biochemists would describe it in terms of molecular mass, 150 kilodaltons. If you're a nanotechnologist, you start to think of things in terms of physical size. And they're quite big things. You can see that little scale bar there. It's 14 nanometers. To give you an example, your hair will be, your hair follicles, your hair strands will be about 120 microns thick if you have dark hair. So we're talking very, very much smaller, thousands of times smaller. If we go down, other molecules you might come across in things like biosensor glucose oxidase, still quite a big molecule, uh, about seven or six by six nanometers, a bit like a cushion in shape. And then I'm going to introduce this molecule and I'll come back to it. And it's called, it was called the adheron. Uh, now it's called the Aphema because it got bought by a commercial company. They were invented at Leeds. And you could think of them as an artificial antibody, and they're very, very small, three nanometers. And if you look carefully, you can see you can see the red colored atoms at the top. They're the binding loops. But there's a purple labeled atom at the bo bottom. That's the single cysteine, which is added on afterwards. That was down to our collaboration with the inventors. Um, you may or may not know that camelid antibodies from things like llamas and alpacas and camels, I guess, as well, are single chain. And for a few years now, people have cloned out the uh, combining sites, the part of the antibody right at the tip of the heavy chain, the single heavy chain, and made things called nanobodies, and they are about that size as well. Um, they have advantages and disadvantages. Um, the other thing to tell you is it's quite possible to split an IgG down the middle. So what I'm saying is an IgG is held together. That's a cartoon that you can see, like a little Y. And the four chains, too light and too heavy, are held together by disulfide bonds. But they're not all the same, those disulfide bonds. So if you use a mild reduction, a couple of examples there, you can split them in half. And that actually, that actually reveals a pair of unique SHs. And I'll, they turn out to be very useful in attaching the antibody and orienting it. Um, so IgGs, we used at first in some of our work, and I'm going on. To, I'll go on to show you some work in a moment. But they're polyclonal reagents. 
So you get a range of binding affinities uh, and stabilities and so on. Now you can affinity purif purify polyclonal antibodies. You don't, you still get a polyclonal antibody, but it's a monospecific polyclonal. And you can also make monoclonal antibodies, but they're extremely expensive, not only to isolate, um, cheaper than they used to be, but about five, six thousand UK pounds sterling to get to isolate the clones. But the real expense is producing the antibodies because you have to grow the hybridoma cells that they're produced by in uh, animal cell culture. Whereas Aphimus, there's a bit more detail on the Aphima now, is easily produced. They're produced in bacteria and they're very, very stable. Uh, and Aphimus have been isolated that really will withstand 100 degrees. So the point is in daily use, and especially I would say in, in countries like India, where maybe sometimes it's difficult to keep things in fridges and freezers, uh, uh, certainly in rural areas, they could sit on a shelf and they're quite stable for a long time. Um, so I'm going to move on to the actual work we did and sort of define the problem and where I got into this area of imaging and then treatment with nanoparticles. Now, one of the common cancers, certainly in Europe, is colorectal cancer and it tends to occur in that area where I've put a, um, a dotted box around and you can see two things one is the blood supply and one is the lymphatic drainage and the little green blobs you can see are the uh, the lymph nodes now in Europe, North America particularly, there's a lot of movement towards laparoscopic or keyhole surgery is the common name. And it's, it's got real advantages in terms of sterility, healing and so on. But it has disadvantages. The first is the surgeon doesn't get to actually feel the tissue. Well, that's that's important. Well, the second is you need to image it with a camera. You can't see it in front of your eyes. So the people I collaborated with, and they're on the papers that I've cited with the work I'm going to show in, in a short while, needed a real-time imaging system. Um, and the key issue is really is not seeing the cancer. Um, I could put, haven't cost, uh, put images of um, colorectal cancers, they're horrible. That's not the issue. So normally a surgeon would cut out the cancer and then something like a two centimeter margin either side in the hope they'd cleared all the cancer. But people it, come back with re-emergent cancer because presumably a few cells have got left and the other issue is that cancers spread generally through the lymph nodes so they will image the lymph nodes nearest the cancer and then move away bit by bit so what you want to see is what are what they refer to as hot lymph nodes you know the lymph nodes with cancer cells on the tumor margin so we started off to try and develop with them uh, a system which really consists of three components, a bioreceptor, a fluorescent tag, and a nanoparticle. So at this stage, we were not trying to deliver drugs. So the first issue is to choose the right target. If you're targeting something somewhere, you've got to have a target to aim for. And 
The first paper we produced in this area is that uh, TNN paper. It's got me on it and the cancer surgeons and so on. They're the um, clinical collaborator, uh, Professor David Jane, who's a surgeon. And Jim Tiernan looked at about seven or eight recognized markers. And what you're looking for if you're targeting something is something that shows very clear discrimination between normal and cancer tissue. And there were two different molecules that if you look for them, showed very good discrimination. So one is CEA, carcinoembryonic antigen. You would see lots of lots of that in an embryo and it would disappear if the tissue patterns and the fetus develops. Or the other is um, TAG72, which is also a, a glycoprotein like CEA. But we went for, C, we went for CEA since it seemed to have a slightly better discrimination. So at that stage, we were looking for particles which we could add a fluor in. Then we could add some sort of recognition. And this is very early days of uh, adherons or aphimers, as you should call them. So really, we were working with a monoclonal antibody, which was, I think, produced by our Medical Research Council and used for some purpose. And then it uh, had, had a load of spare. So our initial particles were silica nanoparticles. Now silica nanoparticles are very cheap. The size is well and well controllable. It's in the synthesis well understood. You can put floors inside, although as you will come to see, they're not applicable for every floor. Um, they're rather polar, so they like water soluble polar floors. Then on the outside of the silica particle, you need to add your bioreceptor. And key questions that presented themselves at the time is what antibody or bioreceptor is best? And at this stage of my talk, I've answered the what antibody is best. Does particle size matter? Um, it does. In, I'm not going to show this work, it's not my work, but there's plenty of studies showing that for particles to penetrate into tumours, there should be kind of 100 nanometers or less to do it efficiently. Um, people have used up to a few hundred nanometers, but the efficiency drops off. And then a key problem is, would we have problems with non-specific binding? And, it's actually crucial to salt that because if we have non-specific binding, we don't have targeting. Um, we have attachment to all sorts of tissues where we wouldn't, we wouldn't want to label. We lose our, our ability to see the target tissue, the cancer tissue or the cancer cells. So we need to stick our bioreceptor to the surface. And there's a number of different strategies we can take. Don't worry too much about the structures. But with silica particles, um, the other advantage is silica and silanes, which are to produce silica, present in huge variety very very cheap and are used industrially for all sorts of prop uh, reasons so we can we can put on an amine using that raging called apts we can introduce carboxy groups and one that's particularly become important we can use azides for a chemistry called click chemistry now the azides they can see the three nitrogens marked in blue i'll come on a bit later on to talk about lipidic nanoparticles but in the same way uh, they're amenable to all sorts of modifications we can get 
synthetic lipids available, which are mostly based on um, phosphatidyl ethanolamine. And again, you can put all sorts of things. And I've shown you an example there, which is terminated with an azide. And then we have a range of chemistries. Now, if you look at older papers, they will tend to use carbidamides like EDC and NHS. So we'll couple a carboxy on the bar receptor to an amine on the particle or vice versa. But coupling tends to be sort of random because there'll be amines and carboxies all over, certainly all over something like an antibody. And that's not what we want. We want oriented presentation. In other words, our little antibodies, which you think of as Ys, want to stick out with the bottom of the Y tethered and the arms of the Y where the combining sites are, the recognition sites, sticking out to the surface. So we've, most people have moved away from EDC NHS to coupling using cross-linkers um, like Sulfo SNCC and what that does, it couples the SH on the bioreceptor to an amine on a particle. So you can see now why I pointed out the idea of splitting antibodies into two halves to leave each half with an SH group or and also why I showed the, the single cysteine added onto the aphima or adiron, if you want to think of it like that, the same thing. And finally, in a later development, uh, but even better, you can use copper-free click chemistry. Now, click chemistry has been around for a while, initially copper catalyzed, but copper catalysis with biological reagents is no good. It oxidizes all the cysteines, it does all sorts of damage. Copper free click chemistry has been developed. And the molecule, part of the molecule, you can see being attacked by the azide is DBCO. And the key point it has a triple carbon bond and a acetylene bond that the azide attaches. So that's electron poor, the azide is electron rich. And it, you think of it as just clicking into place. Um, really much quantitatively. So you can make the two halves of the system, put them together. Hey, presto, you've got a complete system. You attach your antibody to your nanoparticles. So to come back to our first problem, imaging the colorectal cancer, we could make particles there with no problem. We could put dye in and then we tried a range of solutions of touching the antibodies. And the reason I show you this is the logical route to making something that you design and then anticipate how it works doesn't always work. So these are just a few strategies we tried reducing half antibodies using SMCC and PEG is just a, a spacer. So don't worry about that. We tried whole antibody cross-linking with EDC. And all of those show high non-specific binding. In other words, they recognize any cell as good as they do a cancer cell. So that's no good. And it turns out if you're going to use whole antibodies, use linking reagents called dendromers, which are branch structures. And the picture of the one we used, uh, a colored picture on the bottom left-hand corner. Now, if you do that, you get this sort of result. Now, just for a bit of technical information, the maximum image projection is all of the slices of confocal imaging added up. So you've got two big panels of six small panels. The right hand gray image is the uh, interference normal microscopy. But the left hand image is showing up, it's labeling, I think it's a Texas red label showing up 
the uh, CEA and on the right hand side you've got an antibody against CNA I'm oh, sorry the left hand side on the right hand side you've got a polyclonal anti against the uh, heart drug digoxygen in which is a control and you do get a little bit of non-specific label all of those cell lines LS174T Lovo and HCT116 they're all recognize colorectal cancer cell lines isolated at some point from a, uh, a colorectal cancer patient. So it looks like we're achieving good imaging and we are, of course, we can do um, statistics on the cells and targeting is in all cases statistically significant uh, if we target with an anti-CEA uh, antibody but does it work in vivo and i say this is early stage this is the second of jim tiernan's papers and uh, it does so these are mice which are targeted with either a control assembly where the targeting would be as far as my memory serves me it would be a um uh, monoclonal ant an, an antibody against something like myoglobin whereas the experimental panel is targeted against CA with the antibody I showed you on the previous slide and you can see that in all cases at a, sl a, sh a short time period six hours after administration and what you're looking at are uh, skid mice, nude mice, sometimes called with that immune system with a colorectal cancer explant. And in all cases, the nanoparticles initially get caught by the liver. That's, that's very, very common. Um, and it does raise an issue later on because you, want off, you don't want liver toxicity emerging. But in the CEA targeted tissue, um, um, nanoparticles they then migrate from the liver to the tuna tumor okay back to a back to Athenas to remind you again small they're the binding loops there's a cysteine that we added on they're monoclonal so I have the sequence of them all they're selected by directed evolution or face display technology so they, they never see an animal which is another advantage in modern society people don't yell at using experimental animals if they can avoid it and it's prob probably morally proper not to use them if you can at all avoid them the other point i made is because these are a single chain and they don't have all sorts of modifications like glycosylation that antibodies have you can make them in e coli very very cheap to make and um, the company called Avacta now make those commercially you could send them a target and they make them they're quite expensive but once you've got the clones of course they're as cheap as anything and if you're interested in reading about those those two papers at the bottom TDL 2014 uh, that's the initial description 2017 is a sort of paper that I can't remember the exact title, but it might as well be everything you can do with antibodies, you can do with aphemas as well or better. So, question arises then can we target drugs as well as fluors to cancers using aphemas? Lots and lots of examples. There's some I've given you, but the others are they're almost non-immunogenic, and I think it's because they're small, rigid molecules. Well, that's that's been tested, and they've one of the issues in injecting proteinaceous reagents into people is you raise antibodies against those reagents, and ultimately they stop working because your own immune system just mops them up. But the 
bottom of those bullet points is a real issue. We can add all sorts of tags. I've indicated you could have cysteine, but we can add all sorts of other affinity tags if we wanted to then see where they were with a, a, fluoresc a fluorescent tag or similar. So I'm going to describe two systems developed by my PhD st uh, students and postdocs. One is silicon nanoparticles targeted by affinous for hydrophilic drugs. One is lipid nanoparticles um, for hydrophobic drugs. So, so we'll go to silica particles first. And this work is done by a, another tr surgeon studying for a PhD, a junior surgeon called Yazak Khaled, and his name will appear at the bottom of some of these. So it was able to make silica particles and it was able to put NIR664, which is a uh, long wavelength excitable dye. So it's excitable in the sort of red regions. And that's quite important if you're, uh, if you're doing medical work because tissue tends to absorb blue light. And you can see the size of those particles and there's an electron microscopy image there. They're on average about 60 nanometers or so diameter. So an ideal size. And the affirma we were using, it turns out to be one of the best ones they ever made, was made uh, isolated by my student, uh, Shazana Shamsuddin, who is now an academic uh, back in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur. And she isolated three clones. Uh, you see at the top, ADH, CA1, 2, and 3. Remember, adherons, aphimers, same thing. And uh, they were still sort of called adherons at this time. And there's a validated anti-CA monoclonal antibody. And you can see they recognize the cancer cells, LOVO cells, uh, but they don't light up. Um, HEC293, which are embryonic kidney cells, there's, there's nothing there. And uh, uh, colorectal cancer cells tend to have lots of CEL. So that's the one we concentrated on. Um, it has the best balance of affinity and yield when you then produce it in E. coli. It's very, very specific. You can see it's in LOVO cells. Um, in fact, all those adherons slash aphimers against CA are in LOVO cells. An aphimer that's a negative one uh, against Y sumo, which is a small protein in any cell doesn't light it up. The affirma doesn't light anything up in hex cells and do the negative control. If you don't have the idea on even in LOVO cells, of course, you don't get any um, any signal. And that's Yazan Khaled there. This is work in 2016. Again, is it specific? Well, it is. In fact, it's probably even better than a monoclonal antibody. You can see single slice statistics and image stack, which are like the other images I'll show you. Way, way more labeling of our cancer cells. And all those cells, there are cancer cells, LS174, LOVO, particularly nasty invasive colorectal cancer, and HTC116. So we're, tar we're targeting correctly to actual cells. And now the drug. So this is a dual use drug, actually. Um, it was developed for photodynamic therapy. And Foslips, the um, commercial name for it. So it's a formulation made by J uh, Biolitech AG. And as an active drug, it's a photosensitizer, has a phototoxic effect. So if you shine light on that, 
it will pass its uh, electrons onto oxygen, make reactive oxygen species and basically start killing the tumour and the tumour vasculature. And if you look, it looks very much like heme and it's based on heme. You think of it as a heme with some other things stuck on the side and no iron. Well, as I said, it's excited and emits at red wavelengths um, deliberately because the red wavelengths have good tissue penetration. So the idea, the idea was to find out could it localize cancer cells? Could it kill cancer cells with PDT? Because even with keyhole surgery, of course, you can deliver red laser illumination down fiber optic cables. And it correctly targets, so that's phospholipid silica particles with a CEF. The controls are all pretty much negative. The anti-CA aphima, the one I showed you before, the S one, targets very specifically to all three types of cancer cell lines. It's very, very statistically um, valid, uh, so even more so than the antibodies. And very importantly, has no dark toxicity. So even with quite a lot of phospholipid in there, you can see neither LOVO or HEX cells are killed. When you shine light on the cells, you can see the panel to look at really is the LOVO anti CA panel, correctly targeted, correct cell. Those cells are now showing reactive oxygen species. It's a, a reporter called DCFDA. And if you illuminate, look at the bottom right hand panel, then in fact, cancer cells are killed. It's dose dependent and actually it's, um, it's also um, amount of light dependent. And so we're getting cell killing in vivo and we've now been able to show cell shrinkage that's just been just about being published now so the final thing i wanted to get to grips with and uh, this is work by um a newton fellow um a guy from uh kolkata in india dr Rindam Pramanik, who had spent two years with me, and then two or three more years with one of my collaborators at, at Leeds. And you have a problem with low to middle income nations. And that is a lot of the cancer therapies, a lot of biologics are very expensive. So they're, they're actually to some extent limited, even in pretty rich countries like the UK. So we need cheap anti-cancer drugs and we need cheap delivery system. So I'll tackle the cheap delivery system first. Um, and that's a beautiful paper by Rindam Pramnik on the work he did with me and a little bit with the next guy I worked for. The particles we used are called cubosomes. Now, they're lipidic particles, but they're not in any way like a, a lipsome. They make those sorts of structures that I've shown you on the right. And they are like little cubes. There's an electron micrograph. The imaging on that micrograph is the actual drug itself, which is a copper drug I'll show you in a minute. So you can encapsulate hydrophobic drugs. You can target with aphimazole antibodies using the sorts of coupling chemistries and i've shown you the um bottom right hand corner molecule before on a previous slide and most important the u.s federal drug administration has approved them as um what's now being known as nutrical nutraceuticals for event for vitamin delivery and so on but the point is that very much simplifies the regulatory route which is often very expensive and the thing that takes uh, quite a long while. 
The drug itself was delivered, was actually invented by um, a guy who's now retired, who I collaborated with a bit, called um, Professor Panchidam Pramnik. Uh, no, no coincidence the name's the same, Arindam is Panchinan's son. Um, Panchinan is a chemist who works in Kolkata, Professor of Chemistry Emeritus. And invented a series of drugs and they're um, organocoppers. So the one we use is copper aceto acetanoate. Bit of a mouthful. Now untargeted, the, the, that drug kills everything. It makes reactive oxygen. It makes it metabolically. It uh, accepts electrons for the end of the mitochondrial electron transport chain and makes reactive oxygen. And you can see at the bottom, hex cells and colorectal cancer cells are both killed very easily by um, copper acetonoacetyle acetonoacetate. It's a bit old, a bit of a mouthful, difficult to say. Um, you can see a quite fairly low concentration, but I say it's very, very cheap stuff. So it, you couldn't deliver it systemically. You couldn't just put it into people because you'd get all sorts of off-target toxicity. And the way it works is by depolarizing mitochondria. All of these data is in the, the paper I showed you on the previous slide. So if you look at the red images, they're polarized. If you look at the green images after treatment, that's depolarization. Um, and depolarization tips the cells into a apoptosis. If you look at the 2D uh, fax scans at the bottom, you can see the amount of green increasing in the treated cells, and that's depolarized cells. And there's all sorts of other data that I'm not showing you that show caspases and exin 4 and all sorts of the biomarkers show that apoptosis is being triggered. One thing I would draw to your attention, you've come across HEC and LS174T cells, which are the colorectal cancer cells. MCF7 are breast cancer cells. I think possibly for T1 as well. Um, so direct targeting causes cell killing. You look at cell survival versus concentration or cell survival versus time. And the one with the big yellow star, all the others are controls. That's the correct aphima um, and correct cell type. In other words, LS1740 colorectal cancer cells with the correct aphima, not an incorrect aphima like uh, antimyoglobin. More importantly, these cells actually work in, these, these particles actually work in vivo, these uh, drug particles. Um, they work well. So if you look at the localization from fluorescent tag, the CEA targeted cells all ends up pretty much in colorectal cancer, teeny bit in the liver and kidneys, um, but not enough to sh cause any pathology. Uh, doses that have real effects. So the bottom right hand corner panel are mice. I think there's something like 12 mice. So it's limited in number from ethics. And you can see targeted particles, untargeted control particles. Targeted particles are way more effective at uh, preventing the mice from dying and we've got other uh, information now so shrinkage of um, tissue and you can see a little bit of that on the left hand bottom corner where the targeted cancer cells the cancer tissue has shrunk that's the uh, cancer exploit okay so I did mention before that MCF is a breast cancer cell. And it turns out, and this is a little bit of work, um, Rindam, 
Kamenik did in his sort of own time with the help of a guy called Tom Hughes, who you'll find on the paper. That's uh, Tom is a person who Brendan went to work with after me in the University of Leeds uh, for a, a postdoctoral fellowship. And a lot of breast cancer cells overexpress a cell surface marker called CD44. And CD44 recognized as a, again, fairly cheap common molecule called hyaluronic acid. It's actually in a lot of adverts for um, cosmetics now as keeping your skin nice and smooth. Targets to ladies who want to keep their skin, skin nice and smooth. And you can see that if it's correctly targeted and it's a cell that does make um, lots of excess CD44 like MDA, MB231, then it will target those cancer cells. And more importantly, it will do apoptosis in CD44. 44 positive 2D and 3D cell cultures. The 3D cultures are on the top right-hand side. And if you look at the critical organs in, in mice in this case, but I guess in all mammals, things like kidney, liver, heart, lungs, brain, spleen, there's no damage whatsoever seen. So you're correctly targeting, driven all of this very toxic drug just to where it wants to go. And that's just, it was just published right at the end of last year in uh, molecular pharmaceuticals. So that's it. Thank you all for listening. Um, thanks for all the people who funded me. Thanks for all my Leeds collaborators, but thanks for all my EU and global current collaborators, not least India and Bangladesh. Um, too many names, lots and lots. Uh, I retired last October. So this is, Possibly my last, if not one of my last talks, I'll give. So thank you. I'll exit out of that. And if you've got questions, fire away. Hello, you there? Perhaps not. Hello? Hello? Yes, sir. Thank yeah. you, sir, I'm for your question. Amazing presentation. Hello. Oh, no, and the perspective was truly valuable. Yeah, Thank you to... once again for your time and sharing your insights and expertise with us. Now the session is open for questions, if any. And as I as I said, you can either post the questions in the chat box or directly ask the question to the speaker. Just unmute your mic and ask the question. If um, I would say if you have a question uh, you think up oh, now it hasn't quite formed in your mind, if you um, if you feed that question to the speaker, um, you just say speaker Dempe College, so I'm not sure who it is, they can pass it on to yes, my... I just read the question, which is there in the chat box right now. All right, yeah, so go on. Oh, yeah. The question. The question hello. Is hello, hello, Professor. Hi. Hi, hi, hi. I am a very nice uh, lecture. I am basically a chemist. Okay, I could understand a couple of things from your talk, but one thing I want to know: the ROS, reactive oxygen species. Could you uh, identify those? Um. It's possible we didn't. Um, what you tend to get are there are two or three different pathways, and they're quite, they're, I think they're quite complicated for people who work on uh, reactive yeah. oxygen. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it generally starts off with oxygen radical, and then they get passed to other oxygen species, hydroxy mm. radicals, and so on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's of interest to a chemist. Mm. It matters less to a biologist because they're all incredibly reactive. And what actually what they do, this is quite well understood. Yeah, they react yeah. with the cell surface lipids and they damage the lipids. And of course they make holes in the cells. And at that point, 
the cell depolarizes and you get cell death. You get necrosis and apoptosis, but preferable to get apoptosis that causes less uh, inflammation and other toxic effects. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Okay. Thanks a lot, sir, for okay. very informative well, lecture. Well, and well, thanks well. for also joining us for this uh, webinar. No, 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 not at all. And in fact, um, I'll... I've, yeah. I've, I've, there is one I'll, more question, sir, in the chat box. Yeah. How uh, stable are these mesoporous silica particles for vivo studies? Oh, I got a text box somewhere. Yeah. One participant has asked. So I'll uh, just read it out for you. Yeah. Oh, how stable are these? These are porous silicate. Yeah, I've got it now. I found the little one. Uh, Monica, Monica got it. Uh, very, very stable. You make them, they last for ever, really. Uh, they last quite a long time. I, I, I think, I guess you mean the whole assembly. Certainly days. I mean, we didn't, we haven't done long term studies but they last for days and certainly long enough plenty more than long enough to carry out the studies we did they're very very simple to make as well um so you can make them one day use them the next they know it's not a long complicated synthesis you can make the nanoparticles which are stable forever the silica particles and then once you load them with drugs and put on the bioreceptor the antibody or the aftermath they're stable for certainly for a few days, possibly a week or two. And that's the same for the lipidic particles, by the way. They're very, very stable. Oh, there's the speaker. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, you're going to go. All right. Thank you, sir, once again. The next, we move on to our last session for the day. And the resource person for the next session is Professor Narendra Nath Kosh, Department of Chemistry, Ritzpilani, KK Birla, Goa Campus. Narendra Nath, Dr. Professor Narendra Nath Kosh will be delivering a lecture on the topic, development of advanced materials with tailor-made hierarchical nanostructure and their applications in high performance energy storage technology and water treatment. I request Dr. Chandan Naik to introduce the guest speaker. Welcome, sir. Chandan will definitely introduce you. Hi. Um, Hi. Yeah. Welcome, welcome yeah welcome welcome yeah. nice to see you yeah thank you sir so hello everyone it is my great privilege to introduce the guest speaker for this session professor narendra nath ghosh from department of chemistry bits pilani kk billa goa campus professor ghosh received his phd degree in chemistry from iit kharagpur he has pursued his postdoctoral studies at the University of Delaware, University of Tennessee, and University of Kentucky, USA. His research areas include material science, nanomaterials, magnetic and non-magnetic nanoparticles, mesoporous materials, and nanocomposites. Professor Ghosh has been visiting scientist and visiting researcher, research professor at University, USA, Istanbul Technical University, Turkey, University of Leeds, UK and University of Tennessee, USA. Professor Ghosh has published more than 200 research articles in peer-reviewed international journals and has supervised nine PhD theses. From the year 2020 to this year, he has been placed among top 2% most cited scientists in the world. Professor Ghosh is a fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry, UK. He is also a recipient of Tubitec Visiting Scientist Fellowship Award for the year 2006 and 2009. In 2010, he has been he has received the research exchanges between China and India award by the Royal Academy of Engineering UK. His research activities has been sponsored by several national as well as international funding agencies. With this brief introduction, now I request Professor Ghosh to take over the session. 
Thank you, Dr. Chandan, for your nice, generous presentation, introduction. But however, just a little correction is that that as of now, I have published 100 plus publication with uh, international journals, not 200. So thanks, but I really aspire to do so. Now, mm -hmm. may I request uh, Dr. Bhano to, uh, Dr. Nayak to play my presentation? Thank you, Dr. Bhano. Okay. So, good afternoon, everybody. Now, today I am going to share with you that some of the research findings, what we are doing for the last uh, uh, for the last uh, five years in my lab, and in that in, the, in this course we have developed a couple of we have designed and synthesized couple of nanostructured materials and try to find out uh, whether we can use them as the electrode material for high performance energy storage technology and also the for water treatment. Uh, next please. So as I said that uh, in this presentation I will talk about these two materials. And next, please. Next, please. Yeah, thank you. Now, why we have chosen this type of two applications? One is that with the nowadays. In day-to-day -day life, our <clears throat> energy is uh, the, the, the utilization of energy is increasing a lot, and uh, we are using now that with the, every possible with the possible applications, the expansion of industry, the expansion of our day-to-day -day life necessity so there and but on the contrary the uh, <clears throat> on the contrary the our traditional fuel the fossil fuel they are depleting and not only that excessive use of there that it is we are causing severe pollu environmental pollution therefore we are working on, or we have already utilized, well developed, with a couple of alternative sources, like uh, renewable sources like water, uh, wind, solar, etc. However, for these alternative energy sources, we also need the after generation of the energy, electrical energy to store them and also to apply them whenever they are required. Therefore, there is a necessity to develop the necessary technology for the energy storage. So there, uh, there the necessary for the supercapacitor comes which I will discuss a little bit later. Next slide, please. And another problem we are taking that it is the water pollution. All we know that across the globe, for all the people having the giving the access to the drinkable, usable water is a burning challenge. We are polluting our environment like anything. So, to address the issue of how we can treat the water to make a to make a usable water, we are trying to take a small step. 
here we are targeting two types of pollutant one is the effluents coming out from the textile or dye based industry where the huge amount of dye are present in that effluents so these dyes the synthetic dyes they are harmful some of them are carcinogenic mutagenic sometimes when it come in contact with the skin it uh, causes skin and eye uh, irritation not only that when a colored discharge comes falls in a pond or river it what is that it prevents or it obst makes obstacle to penetrate the sunlight into that water body as well as the oxygen therefore within that sun within there the photosynthesis process they are adversely affected therefore the living ecosystem within that pond or water body is affected another may i request uh, dr naik to just to hit that hide button here just next to the uh, sharing yeah thank you another pollutant we have chosen is the antibiotics you can see that in the antibiotics they are coming in the water body from antibiotic <clears throat> in the manufacturing industries and large scale farming like you know that for the poultry and goateries and everywhere to keep the uh, animals uh, healthy people use lots of antibiotics and in some of the countries without any regulation so from there the antibiotics come sometimes the hospital waste also contain certain amount of antibiotics so ultimately these contribute to water pollute and this from this water this antibiotics residues come in the food chain and ultimately through that food chain or human body we accumulate which cause the antibiotic resistance microorganisms and that is the severe health problem so when this antibiotic resistance is formed then treating a patient is really really tough job for the doctors therefore our another objective or uh, one uh, the objective is developing the suitable catalyst which can efficiently degrade the dyes in water and, and the antibiotics in water next please so, so our present work involves the development of nanomaterials which will be the catalyst for wastewater treatment and electrode materials for fabrication of the supercapacitor next please now what will tell that for the last couple of years we have synthesized a huge number of materials and some of them i am giving you that here the here the examples i am presenting to you they are the nano composites like a graphitic carbon nitrate supported cobalt ferrite nanoparticle and these materials they are used for the catalysis purpose the exfoliated graphitic carbon nitrate supported cadmium sulfate and copper nanoparticle cobalt ferrite nanoparticle decorated porous carbon i will give you some example during the course of this talk that how these materials are helpful for catalysis purpose 
Next, please. We have also developed, as I said, that a some number of nanocomposites. They are, we call it the active electron material for the high performance supercapacitors. Here, yeah. first example is the amexine. It is a very newly developed material from the by a professor or named Professor Yuri Gogotsi from Drexel University, US. He has developed this material, and I will show you how does it look. Like. So this amexine, we have decorated with. We have first made a composite with amexine and nickel hydroxide, and then porous carbon. Let me uh, uh, tell you the porous carbon we are talking about. We have prepared this from the biomass, so we call it biomass dredge porous carbon. And is <clears throat> and as you know that in Goa we got lots of coconut. So we have. Prepared this porous carbon from the coconut fiber. How it is developing from the how it is transforming from porous carbon to uh, from uh, carbon uh, coconut fiber to porous carbon? I will show you. Then we have incorporated the manganese cobalt nanorods and manganese oxide uh, scale like structure within the porous carbon support. We have made the cobalt ferrite. Nanoparticle decorated porous carbon, cobalt ferrite, holosphere. These are the nanoparticle, and now also we have made some holosphere and decorated them on the surface of sponge-like structure of reduced graphene oxide. I'm sure that all of you have known that what is graphene, what is graphene oxide, and what is reduced graphene oxide. But now we know that graphene oxide, uh, reduced graphene oxide, is a thin Sheet-like structure, but we have made we have created and made a sponge-like structure of RGO. Then manganese ferrite hollow spheres and needle-like nickel sulfide we have embedded within the porous carbon manganese ferrite hollow sphere with the reduced graphene oxide. So this material we have used as an electrode material. Next, please. Next, please. No, I think you have uh, jumped one more. Yeah. Now, we have utilized some nanocomposites as a multifunctional nanocomposite, which showed their catalytic activity as well as their activity as an electrode material. Some of them are, we have synthesized a cobalt nickel alloy system, which looks like snowflake like dendrimeric structure, and we have anchored them on the surface of the reduced graphene oxide. Similarly, silver nickel bimetallic nanoparticle with uh, on the surface of RGO, copper ferrite nanoparticle on the surface of RGO. So these materials. They showed their activity both as a catalyst as well as the electrode material. Next, please. So, as you have observed that the materials we have designed, what we have done? We have taken a support, support of either a high surface area material like RGO, amexine or porous carbon and then on the surface or within the layers of this porous support we have incorporated the nanoparticles there, there is for this strategy there is a reason behind it here you will see that the nanoparticle basically when you are talking about the catalyst they are the they are the provide the catalytically active sites. Now, if we take only the nanoparticle or nano catalyst, they are having a couple of problems. Like, 
as their surface in uh, surface area and surface energy is very high they tend to agglomerate and when they are agglomerated you can see that the access to the catalytically active sites to the reactant molecules becomes limited and when it becomes limited obviously the efficiency of the catalyst is reduced that is one issue another issue is that that the remove after completion of the of the catalysis reaction removal of the nanoparticles from the reaction medium as the nanoparticles are very very tiny it is another challenge therefore what we have tried is that we have dispersed or anchored these nanoparticles on the surface of some support so what will happen that the size of the catalyst has increased but these supports they play the dual role one that the due to the high surface area the reactant molecules first adsorbs on the surface so that the reaction efficiency increases because that gives the more chance to the reactant molecules to come in contact on the catalytic reactive sites as the catalytic reactive sites are anchored on the surface of the support that that reduces the chance of agglomeration another thing is that we have anchored the nanoparticles on the support such a way that their chances to leach out is also prevented next please therefore we have taken here i am giving you some microstructure taken by your lab from the scanning electron microscopy you have seen that very thin sheet like structure of the reduced graphene oxide the porous structure which contains of type of the macroporous as well as mesoporous structure of the porous carbon here the graphitic carbon nitrate graphitic carbon nitrate basically you know graphene graphene is that you can imagine all the bending bending rings six membered carbon they are attached together and form a very thin film whose whose the thickness should be one carbon ideally i am talking about ideally now if you replace three alternative carbon or benzene with nitrogen now what will you see that this heterostructuring they are attached with each other and they form this graphitic carbon nitride they form the layered like structures now what is going to happen that as the property wise the graph the graphene as there is a long <coughs> uh the long range double bond after double bond is there there long range conjugation their conductivity becomes very high okay so they are their band gap is almost zero we call it the zero band gap material however in this graphitic carbon nitride it acts like a semiconductor and its uh, band gap is around 2.7 electron volt welcome there and another uh material uh, supporting material we have used that is we have synthesized it is the amexin that is titanium carbide you have seen that how regularly how the regularity of their layered structure is however when we are talking about that graphitic carbon nitride and amexin one of the challenges are one of the challenges is that 
these their layered structure sometimes they collapse during the catalyst reaction or electrochemical reactions when they collapse the active surface area available surface area become reduced so we have to do some st strategy so that their collapse becomes prevented next please also we have made different nanoparticle uh, nanomaterials and we have developed the wet chemical methodologies we don't use cvd or mocvd we don't use any ball milling we have just simply wet chemical techniques we have synthesized this like you can see that a beautiful dendritic structure of copper sulfide the hollow sphere you can see that the red ring and there is a broken sphere is there that indicates that the spheres you are seeing they are hollow in nature of the manganese ferrite you can see that small small tiny spheres of silver and nickel they are forms like a chain like structure you can see that needle like structure of manganese cobalt layered double hydroxides some spherical coach next is the spherical cobalt ferrite and the corner is that there is a dendritic structure of cobalt on where the spherical nickel are attached with that that means that cobalt nickel alloy has formed and the beauty of these things are there when we are talking about the composition of the more than one like cobalt nickel silver nickel manganese cobalt there we can with our technique we can manipulate the compositions when we are talking about the manganese ferrite cobalt ferrite they are magnetic in nature why we are interested also cobalt nickel also magnetic in nature why we are interested in magnetic nanoparticle we have some interest why that i mentioned that separation of nano catalyst from the reaction mixture is one of the challenges now suppose in your catalyst structure there are some nano particles which can act as the active catalytic center as well as provide magnetic nature to the catalyst that means that part is the magnetic has the magnetic property now you imagine that you are performing in a vessel your catalyst reaction reaction is done then from externally you put you bring a magnet this magnet will attract the catalyst and the catalyst the catalyst will go or stick to the one side of the <coughs> reaction vessel then either you can easily decant it or can separate the liquid from the catalyst and again if you remove that uh, if you detach that magnet and pour some reaction mixture and again you can you can use the catalyst so this type of separation we call it magnetically separable catalyst next one please now what i am going to tell you will tell you that some of the synthesis strategies of of the nano composites we have synthesized next please here i am telling you that the composite where in the porous structure porous carbon we have decorated the manganese ferrite and nickel sulfide so this is coconut we 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 collected the coconut fiber from there when we take the scanning electron microscopy of this coconut examine this coconut fiber it looks like this and you can see that it has a layered structure then 
we treat it hydrothermally with sulfuric acid for 24 hours and we have seen that these layered structure become delaminated and some pores are generating and we call it the precursor then with this precursor we treat them with solid koh at the higher temperature at around 900 degrees celsius under the flow of nitrogen and we got this kind of porous carbon structure and now separately we have made the uh, manganese ferrite and nickel sulfide and then by using an ethanol reflection method we incorporated those nanoparticles on the surface as well as the pores of the porous carbon you can see that here nanoparticles are are uh, they are immobilized on the, within the pores next one please here another it is the argeo sponge and composite com uh, cobalt ferrite holosphere and argeo that first of all let me tell you that all these methods were used they are not complicated at all we have all done in the open bench and some cases we have used the furnace we do not we did not use any glove box or any very elaborate reaction setup in some cases we need some oil bath some uh, reflux in the system that's it so here we made the first we made the cold ferrite holosphere by in a reaction mixture consist of ferric chloride cold ferrite we use the sodium acetate as a pore forming uh, the sphere forming agent with the pg uh, and it's in glycol then we mix this mixture put it in the small hydrothermal uh, uh, reactor and then we treat it at 200 degrees celsius for 22 hours and then we collected the spheres and when we did the ACM we found that these spheres are forming basically these spheres are small at uh, the agglomeration of small small cold ferrite nanoparticle and they are the hollow in nature now we have made there is a very famous method all across the world people are using it is called hammer's method to prepare the graphene oxide from graphite i'm not going into the details of it but it involves the Exfoliation of the layers of the, uh, the sheets of the graphite followed by oxidation. Therefore, you can see that this is the representation of the geo, we call it geo graphene oxide, where there are some functional groups are there like epoxy, OH, CO2H group, CO group, like that, and it has having some layered structure or sheet like structure then we use this we take this with this geo we treat it with freeze drying treatment and when doing we did we did that we got a sponge like structure which looks like this now this geo still it contains these functional groups Therefore, by treating with hydrogen, <coughs> hydrazine, which is a reducing agent, we reduce some of these uh, functional groups and got the sponge-like structure of RGO. You can see it in this scanning electron microscope. Then we disperse this RGO sponge and uh, in a RV flask. We add this cold ferrite, we mix them well, we reflux it, and then just by applying an external magnet, we can remove them and we got 
this you can see that on the surface of the argeo sponge these nano nanoparticles of cold ferrite are anchored next one this another one is i'm said that <clears throat> cadmium sulfite and exfoliated graphitic carbonate making the graphitic uh, graphitic carbonate is very easy one of the methods is that thus takes some amount of melamine treat it at 500 degree in a furnace and you go you will get some amount of graphitic carbon nitride and its acm picture i have given now you can see that it is a layered structure but then we tried to exfoliate these layers by treating it with sulfuric acid with ice bath surprisingly we saw that after treating it with sulfuric acid for 8 hours in ice bath we got we could able to exfoliate this sheets but due to this surface high surface tension they become a tab a tube like structure okay we got this exfoliated graphitic carbon nitride right? in a beaker we had cadmium sulfide thiourea we treated it uh, hydrothermally we got again the some needle like non rod like structure of cadmium sulfide we mix it we reflux it for some time in alcohol and then we separate it by using an ultra centrifuge and we got the calcium sulfide graphitic carbon nitride nano composite next one please <clears throat> here this is an interesting material like we got titanium aluminum carbide this is the structure you get the blue spheres are titanium black the red one are the carbon and uh, the black one are the aluminum so you can see that the the layers of titanium carbide are there which is separated by a layer of aluminum now the acm shows that there is no such regular layer structure we call it ti3 alc2 max phase now by leaching method if we can remove this aluminum layer we were going to get the regular layered structure you can see that here after treating with lithium chloride and icl this black layer spheres have gone and it forms this kind of regular layered structure we call it titanium carbide and here on the surface there are some oxygen or fluorine is there because this comes from this <clears throat> leaching agent and we call it the terminal agent when so therefore when we present the chemical uh, way we call that this amexin we call it ti3c2tx this tx is either fried or oh similarly we make the flex like structure of nickel hydroxide by treating the nickel nitrate <clears throat> with urea and this acm shows that it's a flake then as i told you earlier that during the reactions these layers either catalysis or electrochemical what we are study we have seen that this titanium uh, these layered structure amalgam they they collapse to remove that to prevent that we are trying to insert the flakes of nickel hydroxide within these layers so what will happen that that it prevents the collapse of the <coughs> layers next one please now i will giving you some examples of the catalyst for water treatment next please 
Now, <clears throat> what we have targeted is that we have first prepared the graphitic carbon nitrate supported cobalt ferrate nanoparticle. Here you can see that the TM, it shows that some of the nanoparticles are on the surface of the graphitic carbon nitrate and some are inserted within the layers of the uh, of the layers of graphitic carbon nitrate. So these cobalt ferrate nanoparticles, they are having dual roles. One, they provide catalytic active surface, there are the three roles. Second, they act as a spacer to prevent the collapse of the layers of the graphitic carbon nitrate. Third, is that they provide some magnetic character so that you can remove this uh, catalyst after the completion of the reaction easily by magnetic separation process. We have done the HRTM study and we saw the how we measure the fringes. We have done selective uh, area electron diffraction. We identified the diffraction spots and we understand that that this material is consists of graphitic carbon nitrate and cobalt ferrate. Let me share with you, we have done all sorts of analysis like XRD, Raman, TGA, XPS to establish the, and also I have shown you some FPHM and TEM to show the, to establish the structure of this material. However, I am not going to present all this because of the these are very routine work and the result is that to check whether we have got the desired product or not and yes these results shows that I have got the desired product. Now this catalyst what we have designed we have designed it such a way that it can act as a photocatalyst under sunlight irradiation and for that we have taken two types of dye. First, to understand the catalysis process, we have used some model dyes like uh, methylene blue, methyl orange, Congo red, like that. And then, when we understand and also fix the composition, how much percentage of the uh, of the graphitic carbon will be there, how much cobalt ferrite will be there, and then we have also treated with some of the real industrially used, textile industrially used uh, dye. We visited those uh, industries, we collected the dyes from there and also we tested their our, uh, effluent water and use the and find out the efficiency of the catalysis. However, before going further, let me declare that whatever the catalysis reactions or the supercapacitor things, whatever we have done, we have done it. The results I am presenting is our lab scale demonstration. Okay, not even the pilot scale, lab scale, small academic research results. What I am going to present you. Next, please. Now, as we are aiming for the uh, <clears throat> uh, photocatalyst. We have first we have done the UV, UV DRS study of this uh, material first with the pure uh, graffiti carbonatite, pure cobalt ferrite. Using the tau plot, we have uh, measured. We have determined their uh, their band gap. Also. We have done the UV absorption study for all the different compositions and we have seen that the composites absorb far better than the individual graphitic carbonatite or cobalt ferrite. Next, and also we have done the magnetic study where we have seen that the composite, I have told you that the cobalt ferrite is magnetic in nature so it has having some uh, uh, MS, that is the <coughs> saturation magnetization and coercivity 
and when we have seen that the composite also have some uh, magnetic character but obviously as the uh, gravity carbon nitride is a uh, non magnetic material its saturation magnetization has decreased now next please so this table shows that first we have as i said that we have taken different model dyes like methylene blue methyl orange congo red and we have performed the i'm sorry it is it, it is under on the title it is under solar light simulator not sunlight in our lab we are having a solar light simulator as it gives a constant uh same uh, illumination same intensity instead of depending on the natural sunlight which may vary with the different time of the day different days that's why we are using the solar light simulator so we have performed these uh, photocatalytic reactions using pure uh, pure cobalt pyrite pure uh, gravity nitride and several compositions of the catalyst there we have seen that i'm sorry that uh, the slide little distorted here we have seen that 50 per 58% cobalt pyrite and 58% gravity carbonate right sir uh, brother and i am giving you an answer just uh, cobalt pyrite and gravity carbonate showing the best property that almost 100 uh, i mean i would say that 99.99% decomposition is happening within in one case methyl blue it is 45 minutes methyl orange uh, 190 minutes and congo red in 90 minutes as an example with the methyl blue we have seen the how we are uh to monitor the decomposition reaction is that we are performing the reaction time to time we are taking an allocate and doing the and measuring the absorbance by uv visual spectroscopy and when we show that it is the almost uh, absorbance is zero we consider that it is the full decomposition is complete and also we have done that uh, then with the <clears throat> this is the next curve which present that percentage or uh, of decomposition we can see that ct by c0 is decreased a lot when with the time is that and the for the blue color line which is the composite which so that the least time is required when compared to the pure cobalt pyrite and pure gravity carbon nitride therefore these facts established that our composite is uh, is an active and superior catalyst than the pure graphite carbonate and pure cobalt ferrite professor rani can you please uh, you have asked me some question can you please Okay, I'll answer that at the end. Uh, next slide, please. Now, as I told you that uh, these are some uh, industrial dyes which are used in the textile, the turquoise cl, yellow cl. These are the their uh, uh, commercial name. red cl 5b and we have uh, shown that how the the catalytic reaction is uh, the decomposition is happening and we have seen that these composites they are very efficiently they are decomposing this industrial photo decomposing this industrial dyes next please now <clears throat> first of all right hand side what we are showing i was first advocating about the magnetically separable dyes here you can see that two things one the 
colored solutions, the top which is the glycerin blow methyl orange concrete and the mixture of the dyes. And when we are doing the photocatalysis reaction with the uh, graphitic carbon nitrate with the composite, 50 graphitic carbon nitrate, 50 uh, cobalt pyrite, and hydrogen peroxide is a sacrificial agent. We saw that the color of the, uh, of the solution becomes colorless. And now I have seen that one we stuck one permanent magnet at the side of the cubit, and all the catalysts are accumulated there. Similarly, the below it is the different colored solution of the industrial dyes, and we show that ultimately the colorless solution produced. So when we are again talking about that photocatalysis reactions, so there are several species is formed which could be responsible for the reaction like several radicals form that OH dot radicals forms, O2 dot radicals forms, some when the, the, the a semiconductor like cobalt plate is a, semi, uh, is a semiconductor, uh, gravity carbon nitrate is a semiconductor which we have found out in the using the UVDR study. So when they are exposed by the sunlight or solar light uh, they are the uh, from the balance the electron jumps from the balance bond to the conduction band and photogenic electron photogenic electron forms whole forms so there are many species are there which are capable of doing the photocatalyst reaction so how we can measure that or how you can determine that which one is most active species. What we did, we did a very simple experiment. What we did? First, let me explain this graph, graph A. Your black line, which you see that, we just took the catalyst at nothing. No, uh, took the dye solution at nothing. We have shown that up to 45 minutes there is, as it is our period, time period of, your, of our study, we saw that without catalyst, without hydrogen peroxide, it is almost no decomposition is happening. Though there is a high possibility and that due to a long, long, long exposure of the sunlight, the dye itself can decompose. But with this time frame, not any noticeable decomposition we have seen. Now, the green color, where we have taken the only catalyst, no hydrogen peroxide. We have seen that some amount of decomposition is happening. Then we have taken only hydrogen peroxide. We have seen that some amount of decomposition is happening. But when we took the hydrogen peroxide and the catalyst combination. The purple color uh, graph shows that it shows the maximum amount of decomposition. The 100% decomposition happens within 45 minutes. Now, our strategy is that whatever the radical or what are the species is responsible for the photocatalysis reaction if we can scavenge them then obviously it will hugely adversely affect the photocatalyst reactions okay now we have taken like parabenzoquinone which is a known o2 uh, the dot uh, scavenger Disodium salt of EDTA is the whole scavenger. IPA, isopropyl alcohol, is the OH dot scavenger. So, <clears throat> with this red color graph, you can see we add some uh, parabenzoquinone. We saw that some amount of decomposition has been reduced. Some. 
I am saying that some amount. Now we have added some another set of reaction. We added some EDTA, residual salt EDTA, which is the cabinzal for the whole. So it also it also reduces the rate of or the amount of decomposition as compared to the when there is no scavenger was there. Now we add the IPA, which is the OH dot scavenger. We show that it is hugely reduced the amount of decomposition. That means that whatever the OH dot is producing, if we can scavenge it, the catalysis, catalysis decomposition reaction is reduced. So, OH dot plays the more critical role. These results show that. Okay, within this understanding, we are trying to explain by a reaction mechanism, proposed reaction mechanism, how the this protocolic reaction is happening. Next, please. Here, the mechanism, what we thought that it has been used, it is not proposed by us originally, it is proposed by some other professors, other researchers, but we thought that that would be the uh, appropriate uh, to, to, uh, to explain the mechanism. So here, that the yellow sphere is called known as graphitic carbonate and the other one, the pinkish one is the cobalt ferrite. It has their own conduction band at the graphitic element conduction band is minus 1.13 electron volt. The valence bond is 1.57 electron volt. Whereas the cobalt ferrite it is the conduction rate is 0.8 and valence bond is 1.844. When these two semiconductors, they are come in contact, they form a electrically charged layer at their contact point. Like the gravity carbon rate side, there is a positive layer and the cold side, size, it's a negative layer. Now in this contact, after contact, when they are exposed by the uh, sunlight or so electromagnetic radiation that there the electron jumps from the balance bond to coverage to the conduction band and now here we see that the conduction band of the cobalt ferrite where there are lots of electrons are there free electrons are there with position is 0.8 electron volt and the Valence bond of graphitic carbon nitride, which bond is 1.57 volt. The electron flows from this 0.8 to 1.57, and they get neutralized. However, the other two, like when the conduction band of 1.13 electron volt of graphitic carbon nitride and the valence bond where the holes are there for the cold right they remains after this. So these are the useful species. And in this conduction, the conduction band of gravity carbon nitride, the hydrogen peroxide and oxygen, they produce, they produce the radicals. H2O2 directly forms which dot? O2 first forms O2 dot 2 minus and then it re that species reacts with water and H plus forms OH dot. And this OH dot, they cause the degradation. May I know how much time I am still there? I'm having? Sir, you have exceeded your time. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, in that can, uh, yeah. so, so it would be better if you wind up, sir, and we have no, a special uh, session on so, your very so important I'm, so yeah. i'm winding up here can yeah. i go to the uh, skip some of the slides yes so yes so yeah, yes, please sir. please skip 
more more you go to the almost the uh, last slides go to the last slide more more in other occasion when we'll get a chance i will discuss this more 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 stop it go to the previous slide okay now i am thankful to the my funding agencies basically without fund we cannot do any experimental result so these are the funds which are the provided by the different indian government funding agencies and some of the industrial house uh, like uh, aitha builder group bits planning and my special thanks to the dempo charities trust who recently as a uh, funded our ongoing project and where our uh, uh, <coughs> make the nano composites for this type of purposes next please our our research activities are also funded by some international funding agencies next please and i am also thankful to my collaborators with whom i have i have performed this kind of experiments and generated this data i am also thankful to my all my phd students who basically worked hard and uh, generated this data and i am uh, on behalf of them i am presenting to you and thank you very much if you have want to questions i will be happy to answer otherwise you can email me uh miss sonia thank you professor ghosh for your expertise on the topic but due to the time constraints we had to conclude the session okay so the next now the session is open for questions if any from the participants as i said earlier you can either post the question in the chat box or you can directly ask unmute your mic and ask the question to the speaker sonia you can do that Okay, Professor Khare, uh, the Professor Rani has asked. There is a question that, in the chat box. Yeah, I am opening there. So, did you check oh, after synthesis with the magnetic particles? Rani, as the magnetic enhances or decreases? It is almost pretty much the same, but little bit of uh, decrease because uh, you know that uh, there is there might be some, but very negligible amount of change, change. in the, um, uh, the magnetic uh, the particular loss of sun. Perfect, but it is not at all that much noticeable. Okay, okay, Gosh, we shall discuss later on. Okay, sir, thank you. And another is, sir, is this method economical for large scale treatment of wastewater? As I, in the beginning, I disclosed that, declared that as of now, we are working on the lab scale. So, they, to make it in the industry, in the large scale, there are a couple of steps are there. Like, uh, Pilot scale, then industrial scale. Therefore, these are three different ball games. We are working on that. We have also filed a patent, but frankly speaking, we have not yet tested in a very large scale or uh, water treatment. But we are aspiring for that. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you for joining online. And uh, we shall definitely have one more session from your side, uh, which may be for, uh, you know, two, three lectures continuously. And uh, that would, I think, your topic will be very clear then. I'll be very yes. happy to do that. And I'm also in discussion with uh, uh, one of my former students, uh, Dr. Uh, Hanudas Nayak, who is your colleague now. And so that uh, which we can, uh, I can go to your college and give a couple of lectures yeah thank you sir. thank you thank you welcome thank you sir now we will have a virtual visit to central sophisticated instrumentation facility that is csif bits pilani
Oh, sorry, come here, Mama Sam. Mama Sam, what are you doing? Gaurang, sound is not clear. <coughs> Are all getting the sound? Different kinds of the materials, uh, materials like biology, and the 
is still string and string. So, in coming to the final of self particles, we have imagined them the weak plane. This weak plane has been different steps, which is we can hide it. And the second one, we have imagined the in the past, and also the pollen grains, which are very structured in the polygated material of the objects. And I think we have a resolution of this because of the use of 3 nanometers around 50 kV and 1.3 nanometers of the uh, resolution around the area of the voltage. And we have the uh, another base indicator which is giving the Trace times, trace differentiations of the material. One level to that, but again, chemistry of materials, we have imaging of fibers, like a uh, fibers of the water. And we have also imaging on the some of the tubes, which are used for the uh, water filter filtration tubes. And also, Offer oxide crystal the orientations and of the first chemical applications we can turn in the microscopy as well as the equipment structures we have seen in the upgrade structure. This will give a image of applications like another benefit is the flexibility of the system that we have. It's a local DNA in advance, which is the uncomfortable. As a normal we know, it's like exactly the follows of the principle of the principle of Bragg's law. What Bragg's law says is the unit factor in the existence set of crystal lattice space such that the factor B appears to be spectrally dependent on the uh, place. It means that for every factor B that you are showing on your pattern, it belongs, in particular, it belongs to a set of uh, crystal lattice space. When we, if we go to the main components of the XRD, these three are the main components. This is the source. And this is the sample stage where we are going to mount the sample, and this is a detector. Here we are using the copper uh, source. This entire one we call it as a copper source and explain to you. Here, this is the sample. However, we are going to prepare the sample like this. So, this is the sample. This is the corundum sample that we have. We just need to press the sample here with this, and we have to put it inside and secure it with this top one. And Put it here. That's it. That is detector. This is the uh, the best part about the detector is that it it uh, cuts the fluorescence hundred percent with zero percent intensity loss. Now we move to the sample preparation. Sample preparation is uh, goes like this. The best part of XRD is that you can do any kind of sample from liquid sample to powders as well as thin films to solid blocks. Any sample you can do. When it comes to applications of XRD, identification of both crystalline and amorphous phases and determination of specimen purity, quantitative analysis of both crystalline and amorphous phases in multiphase mixtures, microstructure analysis we can do where we can find out the crystallite size and micro strain in the sample. We can find out the bulk residual stress resulting from thermal treatment or machining in manufactured components. This is how we have to prepare the sample. It should be completely flat. So yeah, here we are seeing the data of a standard sample. In our case, it is corundum, which is Al2O3. If you see the data, it is giving a very nice sharp peaks. It means that the uh, sample is highly crystalline. Uh, if you give broad, if you get broad peak, it shows the sample is amorphous. If you go to the left side and see the settings, these are the settings that we are using to generate the XRD data. Here you can see the voltage and current that we have that we will use to generate X-rays. Thank you so much for your time. Think how the liquid mass Operation one to the mass spectrometer. So here, this operation technique, we have the alternative 
so that the output line will not be greatly second. This is the higher model. And then we have the detector. Here is detector. Here is detector. Then we can 
types and then chloroplasts and different different ages we can find out the same and then some of the three ages and then this is chloroplast and then that some trading one is there is the following grades. So the dealers and cats and then the one of the dealers that is the computer and that of the function. So like this we can collect it and Hi, welcome to CSRM. I am Ramya. I am the administrative staff. I am the first part of contact. You can send a request. I will be providing you with the UIN uh, number, which is unique registration number, for which you, you, can, you have to just fill it once, one time user form, followed by as and when you require, you can use the same number to use our facility. So, these are the steps. Are already there in our website. You can just check it. Step by step, I have mentioned. And uh, this is the user, the current user of ours. For further details, uh, you can get it back to me. Thank you. We thank Bits Pilani, KK Birla Goa campus for the enriching and knowledgeable virtual visit to CSIF. Requesting all the participants to fill the feedback form posted in the chat box for which after completion, you will be uh, getting e-certificate emailed to the registered email ID. Now, I request Mrs. Varsha Virjinkar to propose the vote of thanks. Good evening, all. Thank you is such a prayer that cannot be seen or touched. It must be felt by heart. I feel honored and privileged to get the opportunity to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. On behalf of the chemistry department of Dempe College of Arts and Science, I would like to express my gratitude to our distinguished speakers, Professor Takahiro Maruyama, Professor K.S. Rane, Professor Paul Milner, and Professor Narendranath Ghosh for their excellent presentations and making this webinar innovations and applications in materials chemistry, interesting and meaningful. I extend my gratitude to our associate institutions, major university Japan and Bits Bilani KK Billa Goa campus for giving our participants an exciting opportunity to visit their campus and sophisticated instrumentation laboratories in the form of a virtual tour of the premises. I would take this opportunity to express my deep regards to our management, Dempo Charities Trust, Administrator Sri Rajesh Batikar, and our Principal Madam, Professor Vrinda Borkar, for being a constant source of motivation and gu uh, guiding force in our endeavor and efforts in the organization of this webinar. My deep thanks and appreciation goes to all the participants who were live with us and attended the webinar with enthusiasm and made it a great success. I thank Dr. Banudas Naik, organizing secretary, and the entire organizing team for working hard for the past few days to make this webinar successful. Last but not the least, I would thank Mr. Gaurang Bane for, this, for his technical support. Thank you everyone once again for making it a great success. Thank you all. And let us meet again on an offline mode conference or seminar. Thank you all. <laughs>